Hey, welcome back to the Tyler Living Room. It's just great to see all of you. So we've entitled this series Sheltered, right? Okay, why? Because all of us are sheltering in place right now. As of this filming, we've been sheltering in place for like 38 days right now, okay? And as we are doing this series, we are studying 10 shelter-in-place moments that are revealed to us in the Bible. And why? Why are we doing this? Well, we are wanting to receive from God His guidance for sheltering in place. For our experience today, you know, as we are in our moment, but we're looking back on these times in the Bible for wisdom and insight. Now, my hope is that you're able to watch these videos with at least one person, preferably with those that you're sheltering in place with, because it's very interactive in this series, and we're going to be giving you a bunch of, you know, discussion questions. Actually, here's your first discussion question. It's kind of a fun one, and here it is. What is your favorite memory of being on a boat or a ship? Okay, so take a moment, talk about that one. Welcome back. So my favorite moment of being on a ship was actually when we were with our family on a cruise to Alaska. Here's a picture of it. Uh, yeah, some of you are like, that's your family, Mark. Now we understand, you know, a little about your life. But we had so much fun together, as you can certainly tell. Awesome food, stunning views of Alaska, just incredible. And the highlight was being able to actually officiate a renewal of vows ceremony for my parents, their 50th anniversary. It was a little weird, honestly, seeing them kiss, but beyond that, we survived, you know? What I want to do right now is I want to give you permission to just kind of let your imagination run wild, okay? Uh, for a few moments, okay? I don't want you to imagine that like the Warriors are playing again, but something different. I want you to imagine that as you've been sheltering in place, okay, Imagine that you're on a boat, okay? Your boat is your house. Your boat is your apartment. Your boat is where you're sheltering in place. And you've been on your boat for well over a month right now, right? Some of you are saying, I'm getting seasick, and I'm kind of feeling the same way. Now, I think we can all imagine, I think we can, that we are the passengers on this boat, right? But who's the captain? Well, it kind of depends on who you listen to in the news. Some say the captain is, well, Dr. Fauci. He's this coronavirus expert. He has all the answers and we're locked in our boats, you know, right in place for our own safety and also for the lives of saving thousands of, you know, American citizens. And others are saying, no, 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 the person that's calling the shots, that's the federal government and it's Donald Trump. Others are saying, we hear, no, no, it's Gavin Newsom. It's at the state level. You know, who is really leading this thing? <laughs> Nobody really knows, right? Have you noticed, have you noticed that there are so many mixed messages out there, contradictory things that are constantly bombarding us right now from the media, doctors and the CDC and politicians, and all these messages seem to be causing a lot of confusion. You know, um, someone gave to me, and I think these are great, you'll like them, uh, these official ton in cheek coronavirus guidelines, and there's 10 of them, and here they are. Maybe you can relate to some of this. Number one, basically you can't leave the house for any reason, but if you have to, then you can. Masks are useless, but maybe you have to wear one. It can save you. It is useless, but maybe it's mandatory as well. Number three, stores are closed, except the ones that are open. <laughs> Four, 
You should not go to hospitals unless you have to go there. Same applies to doctors. You should only go there in case of emergency, provided you're not too sick. Five, the virus is deadly, but still not too scary, except that sometimes it can actually lead to like a global disaster. Gloves won't help, but they can still help. Everybody needs to stay home, but it's important to go out. The virus has no effect on children, except those that it affects. Animals are not being affected, but there is still this cat that tested positive in Belgium and a bunch of tigers out there as well. And finally, you will have many symptoms when you are sick, but you can also get sick without any symptoms. Wow. Has this like become a little confusing for you? Would you even call it bewildering? I mean, we hear things like, this is an unprecedented time in history. All of humanity has never experienced anything like this before. And I suppose that's true in one sense. But is this the most bewildering and confusing time in human history? Well, let's go back in time. Let's go back several thousand years ago, and let's consider what I think is one of the most epic and most, at the same time, confusing and bewildering moments in history for someone that was sheltering in place. We're gonna look at Noah in the ark. Genesis chapters six through nine. Now, I'm not going to read all four of these chapters. You could do that later, but I'm going to recap the story, okay, and showing you key verses on the screen as we go along. Now, the context as we are building to Genesis 6 through 9, one word, wickedness. Wickedness. I mean, after Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden, we covered that in our last message. Earth experiences this massive population explosion due to the very unique environment that no longer lists exist today, but people were living super long lives back then, several hundreds of years old. In Genesis chapter 4, Cain, Adam's and Eve's son, kills Abel. We have the first murder. And, and, and sin, which we defined last time as the misuse or abuse of freedom, it just is running rampant all over the earth. In Genesis 5 and 6, Population is exploding, but sin is also exploding, like a cancer. It's literally out of control. We're talking Sodom and Gomorrah, literally on steroids. You come to Genesis chapter 5, verse 5, and it says that the Lord God, he saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil. Can you imagine every inclination only evil. And God's patience, it comes to an end. I mean, even now, God is patient, right? 2 Peter 3, 9 says, God is patient, not willing for any to perish, but all to come to repentance. And we know in the future, God's patience will even run out. And, uh, and, and the same thing was happening here back then. You know, in Genesis chapter 5, verse 7, it says, the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race that I have created. Wow. Did God make a mistake with the human race? God never makes a mistake. God has a sovereign and good purpose for everything he does, everything he wills. And when we come to Genesis 6 verse 8, it says, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. So God makes a sovereign choice. He chooses Noah, just like God has shown you favor. Genesis chapter 6 verse 9 tells us this is the account of Noah and his family, which we're going to kind of get into right now. But I just think it's interesting that, you know, there's an account being written of you and your family as you're sheltering in place. We're going to read Noah's, or we're going to kind of understand Noah's as we're going to continue that story now. So we're told that Noah, he was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And I think about, you know, just uh, sibling rivalry. I wonder if there's ever a time that Japheth and Shem were like, man, we got to take a bite out of Ham. I'm sorry about that. But God tells Noah what he is going to do, that God is going to put an end to all people on earth because the earth is filled with all this violence. You think that was a little confusing? You think that was a little bewildering? I mean, what would you think if God came to you and said, guess what? I'm going to put an end to all, almost all humanity. Wow. And God, you know, gives to Noah one primary command. He says in Genesis 6, 14, he says, so make yourself an ark. You think that was confusing? That was bewildering to Noah? 
No, my, most likely, I've never even seen rain. There was a different hydrological system in place back then. I'll talk a little bit about that later. Uh, and, but God says, okay, make an ark. Literally, ark literally means hollow chest, a box that's designed to float on water. And I'm sure Noah's, what? You know, and so God gives Noah some specifics. It's to be of cypress wood, which was very abundant uh, it, it, in Noah's area, where he, most scholars think modern day Turkey, right around there. It's to have rooms, okay? So Noah got that, rooms, okay. Coated with pitch inside and out. This was a resin substance that was readily available there. And then God gives Noah the dimensions, 450 feet long. I mean, a football field is 300 feet long. This is like a football field and a half long, 75 feet wide, 40 feet, five feet high. Wow. The ark was not designed for its aesthetic beauty or speed, but the dimensions would provide this amazing stability and make it literally unsinkable. Now, as we continue our story, I'm going to show you three kind of realistic renderings of what the ark may have looked like, okay? God said, okay, put a door on the side of the ark, which the animals would have come in. It was to have three different levels. I mean, this is a massive ark, lower, middle, upper. Put a roof on it, you know, with an opening, a kind of a window. And, and know you're to bring into the ark you, your, your, your sons, your wife and their sons, so a total of eight and all. And also bring into the ark two of all living creatures, <laughs> animals, birds, reptiles, male and female, and keep them alive with you, and also uh, know you need to feed them. Let's do a little calculating for a second, because I kind of like this. The volume of space in the ark, you know, based on these dimensions, if you do the math, was 1.4 million square or cubic feet. 18,000 species live on Earth today. You double that amount for the extinct creatures. With two of each, that equals 72,000 creatures. If uh, the average size is that of a sheep, you can fit all of that into just 60% of the space on that ark, which leaves ample room for the 1 million species of insects, as well as food that's needed for everyone for an entire year. You run the numbers and it works. Can you imagine being given this task by God to build an ark and then to take care of all these animals, reptiles, birds, insects? So this is too good to just pass up. I need to give you a fun discussion question, okay? And here it is. What creature would you most look forward to taking care of? And then which one? <laughs> Would you absolutely avoid? Have some fun, talk about that one, go for it. So welcome back. So when we come to Genesis 7 verse 1, it says Noah did everything just as God commanded them. That's so powerful. How long did it take Noah to build the ark? We don't know exactly. There's like some traditions. They say 120 years, but that's not out of scripture. But with God's help, Noah did everything God asked him to do and the ark was built. You come to Genesis chapter 7 verse 1 and 4, it says the Lord you know, then said to Noah, go into the ark, you and your whole family, seven days from now, I will send rain on the earth for 40 days and nights, and I will wipe from the face of the earth every living creature that I have made. Wow, sad. Genesis chapter seven, verse five says, and Noah did all that the Lord commanded him. And then we come to Genesis chapter seven, verse 11 and 12. In the 600th year of Noah's life, wow, you think you're old, okay? and God's calling you to things. 
the rain fell on the earth 40 days and nights. Incredible. Now, just a little side note here. If rain fell on earth today, you know, 40 days and 40 nights, it wouldn't flood, you know, the entire earth. But remember, our earth today has post-flood atmospheric conditions. Back then, there was this massive canopy that covered the earth, a thermal water blanket, uh, and it just dumped, it broke. And, and this coupled with the subterranean water system that we also don't have today, but which is described in Genesis earlier, literally exploded as well. And this caused this catastrophic worldwide flood. You know, most of you know I've traveled all over the world. I've been in amazing places, high elevation places all over the world, and I'll find seashells all over. We have traces of this flood all over the world. Well, in Genesis chapter 7, verse 17 to 20, for 40 days, the flood kept coming on the earth. And the waters, you know, just increased. They lifted the ark high above the earth, and the ark floated above the high mountains to the depth of more than 15 cubits, which means the highest mountains were covered by, you know, like over 22 feet. Incredible. Well, what happened? Well, what happened is obvious. Genesis 7.23 summarizes. Every living thing on the face of the earth was wiped out. People and animals only know what was left and those with him in the ark. What happens after that? Well, the waters, they, you know, cover the earth for another 150 days. God sends a wind over the face of the earth, and that wa the waters begin to recede. Then after this 150 days of water receding, the ark comes to rest on what? Mount Ararat, which is in modern-day Turkey. You know, some people think that it's still there. You've seen maybe pictures of it under the ice, you know, but it can never be fully, you know, recovered or looked at or explored. I don't know if that's true or not. Who knows? But maybe that would be awesome, wouldn't it? Maybe one of you will discover it. Wow. But after another 40 days, you know, God, the Bible says that Noah opens the window that he had made in this ark and he sends out a raven first, then a dove, and then the dove returns because it can't find anywhere to land on earth. And then after another seven days, Noah sends out the dove again. And this time, you know, it comes back and it has an olive leaf and then waits another seven days, sends out the dove. And this time the dove doesn't, the dove doesn't return. Finally, after being sheltered in place for 378 days on that ark, a little over a year, can you imagine? Genesis chapter 8, verse 15 says, Then God said to Noah, Come out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and their wives, bring out every kind of living creature that is with you. Yes, sunshine, you know? Hmm. Genesis 8, 20 says, Then Noah built an altar to the Lord God. And taking some of the clean animals and the clean birds, he sacrificed burnt offerings on it. Noah worships the Lord. We've got to finish the story, right? Genesis 8, 21 tells us the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma and said in his heart, never again will I curse the ground because of humans. Never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done. And then finally, Genesis 9 tells us this. I will establish, God said, my covenant with you. And that's including us. Never again. Will all life be destroyed by the waters of a flood? This is going to be, this is the sign of the covenant I'm making between you and me and every living creature. I've set my rainbow in the clouds, and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Whenever the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will remember my covenant between me and you and all living creatures of every kind. And we see rainbows even to this day. Isn't that amazing? I always think, wow, there was a time in history when there weren't rainbows, then God created them and put them into our atmosphere. Incredible. So I know this is a lot, but it's just such an epic shelter-in-place experience. I had to take some time and just recount it. And there's so much here, but let's not miss the tree in the midst of the forest. What is the main principle that we can take away from Noah's shelter-in-place moment that can help us with our shelter-in-place moment today? Well, let me give it to you. Let me give you the main point. Here it is. For every shelter in place moment, God has a good purpose. What? God's good purpose for our moment when we're in it is often beyond our ability to comprehend. It's so true. I mean, you think about Noah in this moment that he experienced. It was impossible for him to understand everything. God, you know, what is rain again? What is a flood? Why are you choosing to do this, God? Your decree, God, for this massive destruction, is it really necessary? 
Isn't there another way? God, what is an ark again? God, I hate snakes. Do I really need to take care of those snakes? God, what if a lion decides to eat me? <laughs> God, I'm 600 years old. Can't you find someone younger? I mean, can you relate to Noah? Questions, confusion, bewilderment. Are there some things about your shelter-in-place moment right now that you find confusing? Some things you don't just fully understand. Are you bewildered by God? Are you confused by what you're experiencing? Do you have questions? You even maybe asking God right now. Are you saying maybe something like even, why me? Why am I going through this? Well, before I give you this next discussion question, let me say this. You know, God can handle your questions. God can handle your pain and your confusion. It's okay to express those feelings to God. And I want to encourage you to do that with those you're sheltering in place with. Here's a great discussion question. What are some things that to you just don't, you don't understand about your shelter in place experience? You don't get this. Maybe questions you have for God, you don't understand. Why don't you talk about that for a few moments? So welcome back. So this is what we want to do for the rest of our time. I want us to discuss one question. I think as we discuss this question, it's going to bring so much hope and encouragement to your life. Here's the question. You know, what do we do? When we don't fully understand what God is doing. Wow. I bet you you've asked this question many times in your life and maybe especially right now. In other words, what do we do when we're confused, when we're bewildered with God? because of our circumstances. And I see Noah doing three things, and I think these are great to just apply to our lives. Number one, do what God clearly commands you to do. When we're confused and bewildered, it's always best to do just what God has clearly commanded us to do. And we see this with Noah in Genesis 6.22. What does it say? Noah did everything just as God commanded him. Wow. Noah built the ark the way God called him to build the ark. Noah took care of the animals the way God called him to take care of the animals. It doesn't say that Noah did some things. It says Noah did everything God commanded him. Wow. Genesis 7, verse 5, it says for us, Noah did all, all, not some, all that the Lord commanded him. Wow. That is a powerful lesson in there uh, for us, isn't it? A huge lesson for us as we're sheltering in place. You know, when we get confused and we don't understand what God is doing, and that happens. It's happened to God's people throughout all eras of history. Let's just do what God has clearly told us to do. Wow. You say, Pastor Mark, well, what has God clearly commanded me to do? God hasn't commanded me to do anything. Really? The Bible. <laughs> God's Word. It's full of commands for us to obey. This is God's word, him speaking to us. Maybe it's time to take your Bible out, dust it, dust it, dust off your Bible, start reading God's word. Wow, start reading the word of God and start discovering, watch this, the exciting, yes, exciting truths and commands that God is calling us to enter into, calling us to do. You will never regret reading the Bible. Bible, basic instructions before leaving earth. God wants to give you his instructions, his guidance, his leading in the midst of your confusion. God's word, you know what? The Bible is the best seller in all 
of human history. I mean, are you reading it? It's kind of like, whoa, if I'm not, I, you know, how confused am I going to be? God wants to tell you what he wants you to do. That's why he's given us the Bible. You know, a few weeks ago, I emailed uh, to you, if you get our followers, emails. If not, you know, um, you need to register to get them. I sent out a weekly uh, update to followers. But I, I gave you a sermon that is entitled, The Time That Can Change Your Life. It's the most, uh, I've preached this sermon more times than any other sermon in my entire career of ministry. And the sermon is on how to spend time with God and God's Word. And so I want to read to you right now part of an email I received, and I'm doing this with his permission. Andrew Picker sent this to me after he watched this sermon. And I just want to encourage you with this. This was super inspiring, and I think it'll give you encouragement as well. And this is what Andrew writes, okay? He says, your sermon on the time that can change your life has indeed been life transforming for me. Your emphasis on spending quality time with Jesus was what really spoke to my heart. So I became intentional about spending quality time with the Lord over this past, past month while sheltering in peace, as we've been calling it. Here's how it happened, and he kind of gets into this. He says, number one, prayer. I have asked the Lord for guidance and direction as to the time and place to spend time together. Number two, made a commitment to God in writing. I will spend time with him every day, starting at 9.30 a.m. in the backyard, away from the commotion and the noise. Three, committed to not read more than one chapter a day. You know, I talk about in that video, you know, just we can get, we can read so much, we miss the message of God. You actually, it's better, less is better in, in, when you're really trying to hear from God. So he says, I'm, I'm gonna read at the maximum one chapter a day, prayerfully asking God to speak through his word. This has allowed me to slow down and focus on what Jesus is teaching. Wow. Four, writing down my thoughts about the particular passage of scripture that stood out to me. And five, meditation and prayer. Thinking about what God has spoken to me about and asking him for wisdom on how to apply that to my daily life. And then he ends up by saying this, bro, this is what you talk to guys, you know, like, bro, I have never heard God speak to me like this, exclamation point. I can't explain it. My life will never be the same. Wow. Why is Andrew so excited? It's always exciting when you start hearing from the living God and you start living out his commandments as God starts speaking to you from the Bible. You know, um, why is this so exciting? Because God's word brings clarity to your life, brings purpose to your life, significance to your life. See, a return to God's word is always a return to reality. It's a return to truth perspective, which helps us greatly in those seasons, and you may be in one, when you're struggling with confusion and bewilderment, like Noah was. Wow. One of my favorite scriptures on scripture is Psalm 119, verse 105. And it says this, your word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. Wow. You know, in the Old Testament, this is literally a lamp that uh, in biblical times and uh, it's made of clay, and you put olive oil inside it, and then a little wick would come out here. You light it, and it would just, it, you can tell, this isn't going to light up the whole room as such, but it gives you enough light to take your next step. And this is what God does. God just keeps us coming back for more, for more, for more. We're reading his word. He, he gives us his commands, your next step he provides. This is why it's so important to read the Bible every day. What do we do? We don't fully understand what God is doing. Step number one is do what Noah did. Do what God has already commanded you to do from his word. I'd like you to talk about this question right now. How might God be calling you to spend time in God's word during this time? And why is this important? Take a moment, would you, and talk about that.
So what do we do when we don't fully understand what God is doing? Well, we need to do what God clearly commands us to do from God's word. But the second is this, wait on God's timing. Wait on God's timing. Now, this is super difficult because none of us likes to wait. I mean, do I get an amen out there? You know, we don't like waiting, especially on someone else's timing. We like our own timing, which is now or like done yesterday, right? Noah waited in his ark, watch this, 378 days. Whoa. As far as we know, God never told Noah how long he would be sheltered in place. Just like we don't know how long we might be sheltered in place. Please don't let it be 378 days. But what if Noah said, you know, as he's on the ark, I can't take this waiting any longer. I'm opening up the hatch. I need my Starbucks, you know, and I'm out of here. And, you know, that would not have gone well for Noah at all, right? And it's the same with us, man. We get into all sorts of troubles. I do, you do, when we start deciding to go with our own timing. Am I right or am I right? This is what I would encourage you with. Would you just think about this? God has a plan for you and your family. You just don't know what it is yet. God has his timing for you and your family as you're sheltering in place. You just don't know when it is yet. You know what Noah did as he's sheltering in place? Noah just kept on doing what God clearly called him to do while he was on that ark. And then he waited for God's timing. He didn't jump ahead, didn't get impatient. I'm sure there were times he got impatient, but he didn't do anything drastic. Are you following me? Genesis chapter eight, verse 15 and 18 says, then God said to Noah, come out of the ark. Then God said to Noah, so Noah came out when God said to him what he should do next. What an opportunity we have as we're sheltering in place to wait on God's timing. One of my favorite scriptures on waiting is this, Isaiah 30, verse 18. The Lord longs to be gracious to you. Do you, do you understand that? God loves you. He longs. What does God long for? What do you long for? You long for a lot of things. You know what God longs for? To be gracious to you. God, he, he wants to rise up and show you compassion. But his timing sometimes is beyond our ability to comprehend. God is the master planner. He sees it all. Blessed, though, are those who wait for him. There is a huge blessing that comes to the person who learns to wait on God's timing. I'd like you to talk about this, if you would. Here's your discussion question. How might God be calling you to wait on him during this time? And why is this important? Would you go ahead and talk about that? Welcome back. So what do we do when we don't fully understand what God is doing? Well, we need to do what God commands us to do from his word. Just keep doing that. And then we need to wait on God's timing. The last thing I see with Noah, we need to worship God. We need to worship God. There is no greater time to worship God, watch this, than when you don't understand what God is doing. It's when we don't understand that we most need to worship God. And we see this with Noah, Genesis 8, 20. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and taking some of the clean animals and the clean birds, he sacrificed burnt offerings on it. No, he worshiped God. Now, worship takes many forms. We're no longer in that sacrificial system. Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice. We worship him. But we see all sorts of forms that we can enter into. You know, there's praise and and surrender is a form of worship and singing and, and giving thanks to God and, 
and prayer is a form of worship and reading God's word and, and meditating on God's word. You know, as I was preparing this message, literally this one, just yesterday, um, Tracy and I, we took a break and we did a little walk. We're walking, maybe you are as well. And uh, so we walked down in our neighborhood, you know, her and I only. And uh, I, I look over here to the right on this corner house and I go, Tracy, is that Les? That's Les Carlos, right? And here's a picture of Les. And uh, Les gave me permission to, you know, show you his picture and also tell his story. But you know Les. Uh, he lost his 12-year-old daughter, Lana, in February. As she was struck, you know, by in this crosswalk by this hit and run truck, just heartbreaking. And uh, you know, I, I we realized we were neighbors. He's like Mark, and I'm like, wow. And I was able to talk to him about followers and you know our church. And so, you know, Les, if you're watching right now, you probably are. We love you. Thank God for you. But I asked Les, I said, Les, how's it going? And he said, you know, I was saying, man, we're I'm still praying for you, and I am. And Les said, you know, it's not easy. Every day is a struggle, and we're comforted by the fact that, you know, we're going to see Lana again. We're looking forward to that, and we, we're upheld by God's people as they pray. And then, But then he said something. He goes, you know, I'm learning in my experience. He goes, I'm learning I can get bitter or better. Hmm. Here's a man in the midst of, what are you doing, God? Why is this happening? Confusion, bewilderment. He's saying, I am learning that I can choose a path of getting bitter or better. And he said this, I'm choosing to get better. By leaning into God, I'm leaning into his word. I'm leaning into prayer. You know what Les was saying? Les is saying, I'm learning to worship God. I'm learning to worship God. You know, you and I are created to worship God. We will never be whole. We'll never be healed until we learn to worship God. To not worship God, ultimately, is to choose a path toward bitterness. Mm. You know, Jesus gave, gives this amazing scripture in John chapter 4, verse 23. And he said this, it's about worship. A time is coming and has now come. And maybe for you, this shelter in place, whole thing, God's trying to say, the time has come for you to begin worshiping me. You've been away from me. Or you're, you're going down that bitter road. Come back. A time is coming. It's now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. Do you know that God is seeking you? He loves you. He's coming after you. Even right now, he's speaking to you. He wants you to worship him because you're created to worship him. Wow. One of the greatest things we can do, we don't understand what God is doing is to worship God. You know, there have been times in my life, you know, and just, God, what are you doing? And uh, I remember a time, a few years back, I was just super depressed. You can tell I'm a pretty up guy, and I really am. But I was just really rocked in my life. God, what are you doing and questioning and just, and so my habit back then, you know, was just to run. I would run in the neighborhood, you know, a mile and a half. And in my run, this is the thing, I would never stop. I mean, for years, I would just start at our door porch and, you know, not stop until I got back. And I remember I kind of went out with a bad attitude. You know what I'm, you know what I'm saying? Pity party, you know, and just kind of complaining. And I remember I, I started my run that way, and about three quarters of the way through, I'm on this really steep hill, and God is just speaking to me. And I can tell He's speaking to me, you know, in one of those moments, and 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 trying to get my attention, but I'm kind of resisting Him. And but He's speaking. He wants to break in, and He just said, I, you know, He didn't say it out loud, but He said, Mark, stop. And I, I just, I stopped. And then I just kind of was like, okay, now what, God? And the Lord just said in my heart, look up. And I looked up, and I just see thousands and millions of stars up there. Just clear, pristine, beautiful. And just God said to my heart, he just said, Mark, I can take, I take care of all that. I can take care of your situation. And as I began to worship God in that moment, just this flood of peace and comfort just came into my heart. This is what worship does, beloved. Wow. I'd like you to talk about this for your life because I think God is trying to break in, get your attention to stop, to worship him, truly. What form of worship might God be calling you into during this time? And why is this important? 
Why don't you talk about that for a moment? So welcome back. Hey, let me just kind of give a shot at summarizing all that we've learned today, just kind of putting it into something small for you to kind of take home and really prayerfully consider. So, you know, we are certainly living today in a confusing and bewildering time in our history as we're sheltering in place, no question about it. But Noah lived in and through a massively confusing and bewildering time as he sheltered in place in this ark for some 378 days. I think we can all agree with that. So what do we learn from Noah that we can apply to our own lives as we shelter in place? We gave you that main lesson, right? Forever, every shelter in place moment, and you're in one. God has a good purpose. He does, he has a good purpose for you. But God's good purpose for our moment when we're in it, it's often beyond our ability to comprehend. So if you feel like you just can't understand some things about God, you're not the only one. You are not alone. And one of my favorite scriptures on this uh, is Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. And this is God speaking. It tells us about the grandeur of our God that we trust, but also God's tenderness toward us. He says, for my thoughts, God speaking, are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, think about how high that is. So are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. God's saying there's just some things you're never going to understand right now on this side of eternity. This verse tells us God is God and we are not. Wow. You know, there's another wonderful scripture on this. I don't know if you've ever seen it before. 1 Corinthians 13, 12. I love this scripture. It says, for now we see only, right now, you know, in our moment, we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face in the future. Now we know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. Right now we see it as a reflection as in a mirror. You know, in the first century when Paul wrote this, the mirrors weren't crystal clear like they are today. I mean, you see pretty clear in a mirror today. Back then, different metals. It's like sometimes you get out of the shower, you know, your mirror is just all foggied up. You can't see yourself or you try to wipe it off. It's still so, you know, obscured. And this is what God is saying. Right now, life is obscured. We don't see it all. But then, face to face, you're going to fully know. One day, you're going to be able to ask God all those questions that are you're concerning you right now. And you know what you're going to do? You're going to go, oh, that's what you were doing, God. Now I get it. Right now, it's obscured. Then it's going to be clear. And you go, what a good God you have been all throughout history. It's just that we, in our puny minds, can't comprehend the greatness of God and what he's doing. To us, it looks confusing. To God, it's clear, and it's good, and it's purposeful. Wow. So what do we do when, when we don't fully understand what God is doing? What do we do? <laughs> I hope you've been encouraged today with these things. Do what God has clearly commanded you to do already. Just keep reading your Bible. Do what God has called you to do. And then wait on God's timing. Don't do something until you wait on God and he tells you the next thing to do. Come out of the ark or whatever it might be. And then worship God. What an opportunity we have as we're sheltering in place to worship God. Wow. How does the story of Noah and the ark end? I love this ending. Noah's on that ark for 378 days and I, I suppose God alone knows how long we're going to be like in our ark, on our boat, you know, sheltering in place. Hopefully not that long or anything near it. 
But God brought Noah and his family through their shelter-in-place experience, right? Just like God is going to bring you through yours. Every shelter-in-place experience has an end. It has a conclusion. And guess what was waiting for Noah and his family on the other side? A rainbow. Beautiful, awesome rainbow. You know, a rainbow, it awaits you as well. Hmm. Do what God calls you to do. Wait for God's timing. Worship God, knowing that a rainbow is just ahead. Hmm. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we admit to you that there are times we don't understand <laughs> what you're doing. We don't understand all your ways. You're God and we're not. And in those moments, Lord, give us the humility and help us to realize that you are our God. You've not left us alone. You're with us. And uh, Lord, I pray that you would help us to do what you've called us to do as revealed in your word. You've given us the word of God, our direction. And so Lord, help us light our path so that we would do what you've called us to do. And Lord, I pray that we wait on your timing. Your timing is always perfect, Lord. And so we would wait for what you say to do next. And as we are waiting, Lord, and doing what you've called us to do, let us worship you, I pray, because you're worthy. Thank you for the promise of a rainbow that is just ahead. We pray this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you for joining us and look forward to seeing you next time.